Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess game. Today's game is an amateur game that's very instructive, so let's get right started. White plays e4, black plays c5 Sicilian, white plays knight f3, d6, white plays d4, open Sicilian, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3. Now we have a famous position where a6 is the Nadorf, knight c6 is the classical, e6 is the Skavenigan, and g6 is the dragon. Black chooses the most popular, which is the Nadorf. And now white has basically several ways of playing it. The most popular is to play like f3 and bishop e3, play queen d2, castle queen side, play g4. That's called the English attack. White plays the move that was the most popular when I was playing this many years ago, which is bishop to g5. Black plays the main line e6. And now the main line for white is to play f4. It's not the only move, but it's by far the most popular. There's moves like queen to f3 as well. So um, there's other things that you can play. Uh, okay, so here white plays bishop d3. That's an unusual move. There is a line in the that was popularized by Volumirovich after the f4 line, where a few moves later, white does put the bishop on d3, but not in this position. Here, the bishop becomes a big pawn. The bishop blocks the queen guarding the knight. Um, it's not a terrible move, but it's not, not that popular. So black gets out of the pin with bishop e7. And now in a lot of lines, black's threatening, knight takes e4. So for instance, in the game, white ignored that and plays castles. And now black should take the pawn. Knight takes e4. So if you're one of those people that says, I can't take that pawn because it's guarded twice and it's not attacked, you're overlooking the fact that you're attacking the bishop. So for instance, if white plays knight takes e4, then bishop takes g5 and black wins his piece back. For instance, knight takes g5, queen takes g5, and black has successfully won the pawn. On the other hand, if white plays bishop takes e7, then black can also attack the queen with knight takes c3. And, and no matter how white plays it here, for instance, bishop takes d8, knight takes d1. And if white tries to save the bishop, then black can save the knight. And black's getting away with winning the pawn. In my latest book, Is Your Move Safe? I have a whole section on these bishop g5 moves, and you have to figure out if it's safe to put your bishop on g5 when your opponent has these discovered attacks. And here it's not. Black can, can safely play knight takes e4. But in this game, both sides miss it. First white castles, allowing knight takes e4. And then black misses it by castling. And now white plays rook e1. And now knight takes e4 doesn't work. Knight takes e4. Uh, white can play uh, bishop takes e7. And now, of course, queen takes e7, loses the knight, so he has to play knight c3. But now white can move the queen with tempo, threatening checkmate. Queen h5. And if black attacks the queen to get out of it, white will simply go queen h4, guarding the bishop that's attacking the queen and the rook, and he's also attacking the knight, and, and white is completely winning here. So once black is castled, then knight takes e4 no longer works. All right, let's go back to the game. In the game... Black plays b5. Black has a perfectly good game here, but of course, so does white. White plays a3 to stop b4, although the knight is not the only piece guarding the e4 pawn. He just doesn't want to move the knight off the c3 square. And now black can continue his development with moves like bishop b7, knight bd7, queen c7. Black plays queen b6, hitting the knight on d4. White saves the knight by playing bishop e3, and now white's threatening knight takes e6, winning material. Black sees the discovery and moves the queen out of the line of the bishop and plays queen c7. So white has moved the bishop twice, but black has moved the queen twice, so the net was a zero gain of time for either player. White plays queen to d2. The problem with moves like that is they often allow knight to g4, hitting the bishop trying to win the bishop pair. Here, black should probably not do that, but rather complete his development first with bishop b7 and knight bd7. The idea of knight bd7 instead of knight c6 in positions like this is sometimes you can play knight to e5 or knight to c5, and knight to c5 would hit the bishop and hit the e-pawn, again threatening to win the bishop pair. 
Black does play knight to g4. White does not want to give up the bishop pair, so he plays bishop g5. Now if black trades bishops, nobody wins the bishop pair. The bishop pair doesn't mean you have two bishops, even though that's what it sounds like. The bishop pair means one side has the advantage of the two bishops, meaning they have two bishops and the other side does not. So if you trade bishops here, you're not losing the bishop pair. So black just puts the knight back on e5. White plays bishop takes c7, queen e7. White's ahead in development now. White plays bishop e2 so that the knight can't take the bishop. It also keeps an eye on the g4 square so that white can play f4 and the knight can't go to g4. White could have just completed his development with rook a d1, or he could have even saved the bishop, bishop e2 where the bishop is no longer blocking all these pieces on e2. And the move knight g4 is not a big deal if black ever plays like queen h4 and knight g4. White can always just play something like h3 and drive him away. All right, so white plays bishop e2. Not necessary, but understandable. Black finally develops the bishop, hits the e pawn with bishop to b7. And white finishes development with rook a d1, putting his rook on the semi-open file and threatening to move the knight out of the way and take off the d6 pawn, which is a little bit weak in this pawn structure. So black abandons the pawn and he plays queen to h4. So here white can go after the d6 pawn in some various ways. For instance, he could play f4 to get the knight to move and then move his knight. So for instance, let's ask Stockfish what the best move order is here for white. I think white's way better here. Yeah, so f4 is the main move. If black plays knight to g4, threatening to take on h2, you simply trade it off. And now... Stockfish thinks the best move is not to move this knight and to go after this pawn, but rather to play queen f2 and let the rooks go after that pawn. And then play a move like f5. For instance, queen g6, f5. If queen f6, white can play e takes, uh, f takes e6. Black can't take with the queen because the knight will take him. And if he trades queens first, I guess he can take the pawn with check here. But now these pawns are getting very loose. After knight f3, this pawn is loose. If the rook tries to guard it, white can just double the rooks on it. And Stockfish has white ahead by almost two pawns here. Let's go back to the game. So in the game, white plays knight f3, hitting the queen. But of course, black can trade the knights and not have to move his queen. So that's what black does. He trades knights, bishop takes. And now white is attacking the d-pawn twice, and it's not guarded at all. But the problem is the queen's in front of the rook, and black can simply play the move he did in the game. Rook to d8, and white can't take the pawn. So white, now white's advantage is after knight f3, which was not the most accurate, is, is down to a much smaller advantage. Okay, so white plays queen to e3 to get the queen out of the way so the rooks can attack the d6 pawn. And black says, it's time for me to develop the knight. And he's ready to bring the knight back to e5 where the other knight has, hitting the bishop again. White plays g3. He can kind of reverse Fianchetto the bishop here, and he drives the queen out of the way. Queen goes back to f6. And white backs the bishop back to g2. That does two things. One, it prevents the queen from having to sit here watching the bishop. And two, it also frees up the f pawn so that if the knight ever does go to e5, in some lines, white can play f4 and drive the knight out of the middle. So black plays the terrible move d5. I'm not sure what black had in mind here. Maybe he wanted to play that on the next move. But this is a counting error because white has one, two, three, four pieces on it, and black only has two. So if white plays any kind of reasonable move order here, he's going to win the pawn. <clears throat> All right, so he takes the pawn. He takes D. Black takes with the pawn. And now white has three pieces that can capture the pawn. Now, some of my students tell me that they use a rule which doesn't really exist called capture with the lowest piece first. Well, you don't always have to do that. For instance, right now, you could capture with the knight. You could capture with the bishop. Or you could capture with the rook. And they're all safe, as we'll see. But on the previous move, where white could have taken with the rook, the knight, or the pawn, well, here you had to take with the lowest piece, the pawn, because the pawn was guarded by a pawn. But once the only defending piece is worth greater, greater than or equal to all the attacking pieces, I can take with any of the pieces. So my student was afraid that if he played knight takes d5, 
that black would play queen takes b2. But that doesn't work. White has a couple of winning moves here. For instance, white can play queen to b6 hitting the bishop. And now black's got all kinds of problems. For instance, if he plays rook b, rook on a to b8, white can play knight e7 check hitting the knight on c6 twice. And now the knight can't take on e7 because rook takes d8 check will lead to mate on the next move. But if he moves the king, of course, then knight takes c6, wins a piece. Bishop takes, queen takes. All right, so that's one way to win. Another way to win, instead of queen to b6, is to play knight check right away. And now if knight takes e7, white would first trade rooks. And then play queen takes e7, hitting the rook and hitting the bishop. Well, obviously he has to save the rook because there's a potential mate, so he needs to move the rook to guard the bishop. But if he plays rook to b8, then simply queen e8 check is, leads to checkmate. So black has basically no way to save the bishop on b7 because all the moves that stop checkmate, for instance, like rook to f8, stops the checkmate, but now white can simply just take off the bishop. Bishop takes b7 and he wins a piece. So if white had, had looked further and he would have seen that knight takes d5 hitting the queen is the best way to take because if the, if the black queen just moves, then white still gets a lot of those same tactics. And if black tries to get his pawn back, well, we just saw the tactics, how they work. So knight takes d5 is the best move. And the engine now has white up by six pawns, as you can see here below. All right, let's bring the window back to the normal size. Okay, so white plays bishop takes d5 instead of knight takes d5 because he doesn't want to lose the b2 pawn. And now white's up a clear pawn with a big advantage. He has both his rooks on the central open files. His bishop is pinning the knight to the bishop on b7. The knight on c3 is solid. So white has a, a big advantage here, you know, like a, almost a five pawn advantage. But in material, he has a one pawn advantage. But the stockfish evaluation is about plus 4.6 or so. All right, so black simply guards the bishop with rook a, b8. And now white should continue his making his pieces better. For instance, he can play knight e4, and if queen takes b7, he has some of the same tactics he had before. He could even play knight to g5, hitting the f7 pawn. If black tries to save it with a move like rook f8, then white can play a move like uh, queen e4 threatening mate. If black stops the mate, now he could play bishop takes, rook takes, knight takes, king takes, and rook to d7 check. And you can see this is quickly leading toward checkmate. For instance, if black plays king to g8, queen e8 check, rook, rook takes, rook takes his checkmate. If black stops that with king to f8, now the white can play queen f4 check, and on king g8, queen f7 check, king h8, queen h7 checkmate. So again, if white looks a little further than one move where he's losing this pawn, it turns out that he's got a massive attack going here, and knight e4 is not the only winning move. So here comes one of the most instructive points of the game. At this point in the game, white said, Okay, I'm up a pawn. When you're ahead material, you want to make fair trades of pieces. All right, well, that's true. You do want to make fair trades of pieces when you're ahead of pawn. Some of my students think, oh, when I'm up a pawn, that's not far enough ahead to trade pieces. But that's not true. There are some positions where trading pieces is not advantageous when you're pawn ahead. But in general, any material advantage would be enough that fair trades of pieces are generally good for you. They, they bring you more toward the end game where the extra pawn has more weight. But the problem here is that trading off here is not a fair trade at all. So white plays bishop takes c6, an absolutely horrible, terrible move. Um, why is that a horrible, terrible move? Well, let's look at the position around white's king. It looks like he fianchettoed the bishop. Now we know he didn't fianchetto it right away, but it looks like he fianchettoed it. So in this kind of a position, all these white squares are weak which means black can attack those squares. He can threaten checkmates on g2 or h1. And the pieces that can mainly do that are the bishop on b7 and the queen on f6. And the main piece that's guarding it is that fianchettoed bishop. 
In general, you don't want to trade that fianchettoed bishop for anything other than your opponent's fianchettoed the bishop or maybe his queen or something. But even taking the exchange with taking a rook is sometimes dangerous. And in this position, white has very weak white squares around his king, and he has a wonderful bishop guarding those squares. And if he takes off that knight, when black takes back with the queen and threatens checkmates, white is already in great danger around his king, so that's not a fair trade at all. Even though bishops and knights are worth almost exactly the same, especially when the bishop pair is not involved, and here it's not because neither side has two bishops. Even though bishops and knights have almost the same value, in this position, trading your bishop for that knight is just a big mistake. Here's a principle I teach my students. If you have weak squares of a certain color around your king, like in this case the weak light squares, and you trade off your light squared bishop for a piece like that knight, and he has the light squared bishop, and the queens are on the board, you could give your opponent almost over a one pawn bonus for having the same color bishop as the weak squares around your king plus the queen on the board. Now if the queens are off the board, then that's different. Then it's not a one pawn plus bonus. But in this position, you could apply the one pawn plus bonus so that if bishop takes c6 and black takes back on c6, <clears throat> it's almost like losing more than a pawn. And in fact, let's look at Stockfish's evaluation. Right now, Stockfish says white, if he plays knight e4, is up 5.4 pawns. When he plays bishop takes c6, look at that drop. 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So before that move, white was up 5.4. After that move, white's lead has dropped to 0.7, even though he's up a pawn. That's how much that trade was unfair. Basically, white lost about four pawns of value in the evaluation by making that really terrible move, and it just, it just looks bad. So let, let's follow the game and see what happens here. All right, so this is not a fair trade. Black takes with the queen, and now he has two threats, queen g2 mate, queen h1 mate. So white starts with trading rooks, and then he blocks the diagonal with the queen. Okay, so far so good. Now black knows not to trade everything off and go into the end game down a pawn, where you know he might be able to hold the end game, but you know things would not be that good. He could play queen takes and knight takes, and if he tries to play rook to e8 to hit the knight, white can play knight f6 check. And now on g takes f6, rook takes e8 check, king g7. He wins, so so rook e8 doesn't work, but then nothing, nothing really works. If he trades off, he has to stop the back rank mate, and now white can stop the rook from coming down to the second rank. For instance, he could play rook here, or even he could play king f1, and if rook d2, play rook e2, and then if rook d1 check, play king g2, and white's just up a solid pawn in the end game. Not easy to win, but Stockfish has white up about equivalent of about two pawns here. All right, so let's go back to the game. So black realizes he doesn't want to trade. He wants to keep using this bishop as a threat on the diagonal. So he correctly moves the queen back. Maybe not. Maybe that's not the best square. Now white can trade off some. Stockfish likes queen to e7. He plays queen to e2. Black plays h6 to get rid of all those back rank threats. White says, let me skewer the queen and the rook. The queen has to guard the rook. Queen c7. Rook takes, queen takes. And now white could play something like f3 to block the diagonal. So that later on, if the queen goes on the diagonal, he can just play king f2 and guard the pawn. Instead, white thinks, oh, let's, let's keep offering queen trades and see if black will trade queens. Well, you do want to trade queens here. The problem is when you keep offering the trade of queens, black will keep turning it down in such a way that he eventually maneuvers his queen onto the long diagonal. And then you're not going to be able to do that. So let's see what happens. Queen d3, would you like to trade queens? And of course, black should not trade here. Even though black has a bishop versus a knight in the end game, and there's pawns on both sides of the board, which is generally good for the bishop, that extra pawn completely wipes that out and more. So, so trading queens here would be a big mistake for black. White would have every, every intention of winning that position. So black plays queen e7, and white says, all right, well, I'll just keep offering the trade of queens. Maybe you'll decide to take me to isolate my pawn. And black says, no, thanks, I'll move there. White says, let me keep offering queen trades. And black says, thank you for letting me get out of the queen trades by threatening these mates again. And all of a sudden, white goes, uh-oh, 
How do I stop these mates? The last time I did it by playing queen e4, but I can't do that now. I lose a piece. So white realizes the only way he can really stop all this stuff is to just give back a pawn and go into the end game. So he plays f3. He has nothing better. But now black says, okay, now that I can win a pawn and go into an end game with a bishop versus a knight, then I will. So he plays queen takes f3. And white now has nothing better than to go in that end game and get his king right into the middle. So queen takes f3, bishop takes f3, and now the obvious, obvious move is to play king to f2. The king is the most powerful piece on the board. Knights are worth like three and a half pawns fighting value. Kings are worth like four and a quarter. King to f2 hits the bishop and wins the tempo while your king gets to the middle. And you want to bring your king right all the way up to these squares and start attacking these pawns before the black king can come in and guard. And, and starting by moving your king up to f2 to hit the bishop is a great start. And White has a big advantage if he does that. Uh, Stockfish says about a whole pawn. Well, that's a lot considering the material is even. Instead, White plays a very strange move. He plays knight to a2. Maybe thinking that he's going to attack the pawn on a6, but that pawn can always be guarded by the bishop or just move. So it's kind of a silly threat and it decentralizes the knight. And meanwhile, it doesn't get the king into the game. So it's, it's a really bad move. Now white's advantage is pretty much gone. Black plays a5, and that's not a good move. The best move for black was just to go back, guard the pawn with the bishop, and then bring the king up with an equal position. a5. Now white should play king f2 again, hitting the bishop and going after those pawns. White plays b4. That's not his best move. Black should trade pawns now. That makes it a little harder for white to create a passed pawn being that after he trades, this pawn will be somewhat backward. And that eases black's defense a little bit. Instead, black makes a mistake. We're seeing mistakes by both players here in the endgame. Black plays a4. Well, that's not a good move because now these pawns are both going to be targets later. And when the king comes up and hits the bishop, he'll be able to play this break move c4 and get a protected pass pawn on the b file. So white plays knight c3. Again, the wrong idea. That pawn is easily guarded by the bishop. The right idea is to bring the king up. I have a lot of my students, especially at this level, they just don't understand that the king is so much more powerful. And here you could get your king up with tempo. It's just a no-brainer to get the king up. Stockfish actually says that the best move is to play the break move right away. And if he takes the pawn, then hit this pawn. And he really can't guard it because if he plays here, you can always play b5 and then bring the king up and start taking off these pawns. So black's got some big problems here. All right, so white plays knight c3, not the best move, blocking his potential break move. Black goes back and guards the pawn. Now white comes up. Of course, he doesn't win the tempo now because he's not attacking the bishop. Black says, oh, I guess I better bring my king up. White king gets to the fourth rank first. And now white wants to get this pawn to c4 and get his majority rolling. Black wants to play something like f5 and g5 and f4. So here white should play something like knight d1 followed by knight e3, getting the knight out of the way so the knight can help push this pawn up the board. If black plays something like bishop d7, you can play c4 right away. And white has a slight advantage here, but it should be a draw. Okay, so instead white plays knight e4. Well, whenever you offer your opponent the trade of minor pieces to go into the end game, you have to calculate that and you have to take a lot of time on your clock to figure out, is that king and pawn end game get me what I want? Here, black can trade the bishop for the knight and go into the king and pawn end game, or he can just move the king out of check, let's say king to c7, and now the white king obviously can't come into c5 because the bishop takes knight. So Stockfish actually says king c7 is probably a draw. Instead, black plays the committal move, bishop takes e4. And now white is on the verge of winning already, if he plays this correct. Obviously, he recaptures, king takes e4. And now black has to figure out exactly how to stop white. White's plan here is to just go back with king to d4 and break with c4 and get a protected pass pawn and then stop the other majority on the other side and try to win the game. So let's see what happens. So black plays h5, and white should get the king back so he can play the break. And he does, best move. And now black should, black's in trouble here. The, 
The white king is excellently placed. The pawn can come up. Black violated the principle two moves ago of you want to move the, the unopposed pawn first when you're playing, when you have a majority like this. In fact, Stockfish says the best move here is to actually play f5 check. And if king takes f5, then king d5 and, and black comes in. And he thinks black might be able to hold that endgame, although white's, white's better still. Okay, so h5, king d4, and now black's in some trouble. Black plays a bad move here, but, he, but no matter what he plays, things are, are difficult here. He plays the bad move f5. So if you've never seen anything like this for, before, stop and take a minute and see what you would play here for white. The right answer is, now that he's put all his pawns separated like this, you could play h4 and make the g-pawn backward and the f-pawn backward, and that would cripple his majority. And if you do that, you're completely winning. Stockfish has weighed up by like nine pawns in this position. If you don't believe me, let's try a couple lines. Uh, let's say he plays g6. White breaks with b c4. b takes c4. King takes c4. Well, what can black do? He could sack a pawn and try to get a pass pawn. He could play here, pawn takes, and pawn here. Tricky, because if white takes, black can get a queen. The right move here for white, believe it or not, is king to d4, getting inside the box here. So that if black takes, white goes here. If black comes down, white goes here. King f3, and now if black comes here, you just push one of these two pawns is going to get a queen. And white's completely winning. So h4 is the winning idea, crippling his majority. Then after that, he can't stop c4. Instead, white makes a terrible mistake. He plays c4 right away. But then when black takes, white could still play h4 and then capture the pawn on the next move. White, of course, automatically captured the pawn. Here, if he plays h4, which is his best move, the engine says that black is now drawing by doing that sacrifice g5, which black, who knows if black would have found that in an actual game. So it's white's best try. But instead, white plays king takes c4. And now black plays the obvious move, g5, where now his majority is a mobile, healthy majority instead of a terrible immobile backward one that would have been if white had played h4. So if you've never seen a move like h4, that really makes a big difference. So black plays g5. And now, according to Stockfish, if both sides play perfectly, it's a draw. And that's pretty much what happened. White played king d4. Black plays g4, which does make the pawns backward. That's not the move I would have played, but Stockfish says it's good enough for a draw. King e3. King up. And now white uses the pawn as a decoy. He plays king d3 first. Black plays his break move to get a pass pawn. White takes, black takes, and white says, you better come back and get my pawn. Black starts to come back to get the pawn because he can't race fast enough against the pawn. Now white doesn't need to push the pawn anymore. Every time he pushes the pawn, he's just losing tempos for the king goading to get it anyway. So white should play king e3 here. That's his best move but it's not good enough to win. White instead makes the common error of pushing that pawn again, but there's no reason to do that. He's gonna catch the pawn anyway, and you're not really pushing him further away because he's, he's going to go to the left anyway. So that's a waste of tempo, but it's not enough to throw away the game. Black goes after the pawn, and now what white needs to do is go after the pawns, and I think they agreed to a draw here. They did, but just to show you that it's a draw, let me play the best moves that Stockfish has for both sides. So Stockfish says, king e3, h4, king f4, g3, h takes g3, and now there's no optical illusion here. h3 does not get a queen. Here's the square. Can white get inside the square? Of course, king f3 would win. So h3 would be a losing move. You have to take the pawn. That's what you're trying to do, get rid of his pawns. King takes, king c6. Doesn't matter where you put the king, f3, king b6. And now, even if one side or the other could win a pawn, the other side could just go to the corner. But he can't. King, king e3, king c5, king d3. Neither side can even get in. But as I said, it doesn't matter. White could even just run in the corner here and give black the pawn. He could say, go ahead, take my pawn, I don't care. And this is a famous dead draw. And black could do the same thing to white if he wanted. He could say, oh, I won't try to win your pawn. You could just have my pawn. I'm just going to run in the corner and prove it's a draw, and this is a famous draw too, same draw.
Okay, so in this game, both sides agree to the draw, and with best play, it is a draw. So there's two big, two big things you learn from this game. One is you want to make fair trades when you're ahead in material, but playing bishop takes c6 was not anything like a fair trade. Bishop takes c6 was just a terrible move, giving away almost all of white's advantage. The other thing was white could have created those backward pawns in the end game when black played that bad move f5. When I say the bad move, actually black was probably losing in that position even with his best moves, but f5 made, it, made the win fairly easy for white. All he had to do was play h4 and then play his break move c4. By completely avoiding h4, he allows black to create a mobile majority, which is enough for black to draw. So those were two of the big things you'd learn from this game. If you liked the game, please, if you liked the videos, please tell people about my channel. If you liked the game, you can hit the like button. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.